Welcome to the Grad School Femme Touring Podcast. This is Dr. Yvette Martinez Vu, and I will be serving as your Femme Tour, providing you with tips and tricks and everything else you need to know to get into graduate school. For the past 10 years, I've been helping undergraduate students get into top graduate programs in their field, and I'm really excited to share this information with you too. Happy Friday, everyone. I am recording an episode today in a way I don't normally do it. I am recording it on the same day that I'm publishing it, and I'm actually multitasking. I am getting ready for my day right now. I am doing my hair and my makeup, and that's because I have been attending a conference this week, so it's been especially busy for me haven't had a time to really prep any notes or do my usual recording and I didn't want to hold off another week before publishing so I figured I'll just do a quick recording while I'm getting ready it only takes me I don't know 20 30 minutes to get ready so that's about the time it takes um, for me to record an episode and I also that's the only bit of time I have left because it's the morning for me right now you'll probably see this will be published in the afternoon so it's the morning for me and um the conference is gonna start shortly so i gotta get ready say a few thoughts about getting into grad school and then you know if i'm not able to say everything i need to say or i feel like um i wasn't prepped enough because sometimes I, i like to have notes then i'll just follow up and do a part two next week so today I am talking to you about what do you do if and when you get into grad school? What's the next step? Let's say you applied to PhD programs in the fall. Maybe you were invited for some interviews, um, interview Zoom days. Maybe not. Maybe you just found out that you got in without any interviews. What do you do next? Well, before anything, you want to make sure that you have some sort of funding offer. Even if you apply to master's programs, you want to ask what kind of financial aid is available to students. You don't have to ask right away because sometimes funding offers don't come in right away. Like for instance, if you apply to a PhD program, um, maybe they, the department um, nominated you for a central fellowship through your university and they're waiting to hear back on that. So if that's the case, then Um, they won't be able to give you an offer letter with um, your award, with your funding package, until a few weeks later. So it's okay to wait because it is still January, but you want to know, I don't know, within a month, uh, so two to four weeks after you get your acceptance letter, you want to know. And it's okay to ask after you've waited Let's say you've waited two weeks. It's okay to ask and inquire to see if there's any financial aid available, if you should expect a funding package. And let's say you've been admitted to multiple programs and you do have offer letters. Um, What do you do then? I actually just met with a student where I advised him to create a spreadsheet. Uh, The student did get into multiple programs, and each of them had very distinct funding packages. All of them in some way, shape, or form were offering full funding, but full funding means something very different across institutions and locations. You know, some of them may be offering 20K a year as a stipend. Some of them are offering 32K a year. Some of them are including summer funding, a a summer um, award or scholarship. Some of them aren't. Some of them are including like a one-time, let's say like $750 one time to help with moving expenses. Um, Some are saying, okay, we're going to provide you with this extra a thousand, three thousand dollars stipend for a year, for two years, for your first three years. Some of them say they're giving you an annual um, stipend of X amount, 20, 30K, 
but they don't tell you for how many years. They just say it's an annual stipend. So you need to get it in writing and find out how many years are they actually supporting you for. Some of them say you're required to TA, but they don't say what years you're TAing. So you want to ask, when am I TAing? When am I expected to do that? Um, the other thing to add to that spreadsheet that's really important is if you apply to programs nationwide, then you want to keep in mind the differences in cost of living. Because let's say you get into, and this is just an example, I'm making it up. Don't go thinking that Ohio State gives you this much. But let's say you got into Ohio State and they're offering you 18K. And then you got into New York University and they're offering you 32K. That seems like, wow, you're going to have a lot more with um, NYU. But then you look at cost of living and Ohio State is a lot cheaper to live there. Um, rent and just the general cost of items there is just a lot cheaper. You're, you may actually have um, more money to work with with that $18,000 stipend than the 32 k stipend because maybe the 32 k at NYU is just going to all go to rent. So just keep these things in mind. It's good to think about cost of living, to look up, you know, what does uh, a room or an apartment look like at the, these different locations and institutions. Do they offer graduate housing? Is graduate housing subsidized? If so, what are the rates for that? And that will be one factor, um, a big factor, but it is one factor to help you decide if you want to go there. Another very important factor is talking to grad students. You need to find a way, if you weren't able to talk to them at an interview day, if there is no open house of some sort, find a way to get a hold of grad students at the different institutions that you've been admitted to. Sometimes you could also reach out to professors that you know. They may know folks who recently graduated from there. They may know alumni who would be more than willing to meet with you to talk to you about that program. Um, that actually is something that we sometimes do, you know, in our program. If one of us knows someone else from that program who recently completed their PhD there, we want to put them in touch, you know, that way, especially if they're like folks of similar backgrounds. So like we had one student who got into uh, an institution on the East Coast and we um, put her in touch with someone else who was also from California, was also a Chicana, had also completed their PhD from the same program. Um, so that way they can be honest and real with her about like, what is it like being a Latina Chicana um, in this state, at this institution? Um, what is the community like there? What kind of support systems are available? What was it like moving away from home for the first time? These are very important conversations to have because this is this is your life for the next four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, sometimes even 10 years. So you don't want to take this lightly. You want to talk to alumni and grad students to see what was it like there? Is it a hospitable place? What's the culture like? Are you going to be supported? Um, are you going to, um, yeah, can you picture yourself living there? And what are some of the um, outcomes? Like what, what are the placement rates? Where are alumni going? What are they doing with their degrees? So these are things to keep in mind. You wanna um, find out about funding. You wanna talk to grad students. You wanna talk to alumni. And then obviously there are also personal factors that are gonna be very different depending on your identity. Um, you know, for instance, if you're a person of color, if you're a black student, you might want to know, like, okay, is this place safe for me? Or is it a very white supremacist space? I mean, we know that academia as a whole is very white um, supremacist. It's just not a space that's friendly to POC. But some places are trying and do have diversity initiatives or include diversity within their curriculum in some way, shape, or form, or have more POC professors. So these are things you might want to keep in mind 
And you could even ask that. You can ask that of the professors if you have an opportunity to meet with them, to interview with them. You're interviewing them too. Um, especially once you get in, you really are interviewing them. You really do have leverage and power because they want you. Um, and they're competing with other people who also want you. So you want to ask them, how do you um, address diversity within your curriculum, within your program structure? You know, what does your population look like? What are the demographics of the program? It's completely okay to ask that. Um, other aspects of your identity would be like, um, other than like, can you picture yourself living here? Is there a community there? Um, what's it like at that institution? Um, what is, what do each cohorts look like? Age sometimes is a thing. Sometimes some programs have folks who are much older, uh, who have basically had careers, uh, before they have pursued grad school, maybe you're the f one of the only younger people there. What's that like? Are you going to feel comfortable in your department? Are you going to feel comfortable with your cohort? So if there's an opportunity for you to meet with others who have also been recently admitted, it doesn't hurt to talk to them. In fact, I see this happen a lot where folks will go to interviews and then they'll keep seeing the same people that are getting admitted to the same programs. And so it's good to talk to them to see, okay, wow, this is what my cohort may look like. This is what other prospective applicants are like. What do they think of the program? Are they going to go? What do I think of them? Are they someone that I feel like I would get along with and I could potentially, you know, receive support from, especially because, in graduate school, the first few years when you're doing coursework, it's all, you know, a lot of collaborating, interacting with your cohort, and you rely on each other to get through, at, at the very least, the first few years of grad school, and sometimes quali qualifying exams as well. So you want to think about your cohort as well. <sighs> what else? So funding is a big one. You know, learning more about your potential advisor from other grad students, learning more about the culture of the department, about the culture, um, hospitability of the location. Also, just in general, if you're someone, I know I have a lot of folks who listen to my podcast who are from L.A. <laughs> I get the stats and at least one fourth of you who listen to me are from L.A. I don't know why. <laughs> I would think it'd be Santa Barbara, but no, it's LA. So if you're a Cali person, can you actually picture yourself living there? Can you picture yourself in the snow, like raking snow, putting chains on your tires and salt on your driveway and whatever else people do when they live in um, Arctic cold weather? So think about that too, because, you know, is it going to affect your mental health if you have a lot of days in the year where... There's not as much sun as in California. Um, it's okay to be honest and forthcoming about these things. Like, do you want to be closer to home? Are you, do you have that responsibility of needing to be close to home because of having to support family members, parents, younger siblings? Um, that's an honest um, thing to consider. Uh, you know, everybody's different. Some folks are more willing to move away than others. Um, it just depends on what your family structure is like and what you think you can handle at this time. So, yeah, think about the community, think about the location, think about whether you can live there, think about if you're going to have support from the professors, from your cohort, if you're going to be able to survive there uh, financially as well. Yeah, I would say those are definitely some things. Oh, and one other thing I wanted to say is don't feel the need to say yes right away. I know you were gonna get pressured to say yes, but you have for most, if not all programs, you have until April 15th. It's that tax deadline and grad school deadline. You have until April 15th to say yes. So don't feel rushed, even if they keep reaching out to you to hope that you make a decision, you are entitled to wait until April 15th you are entitled to negotiate for more funding. 
Um, I, I, I believe I recorded um, an episode on negotiating uh, last year. So go back to my older episodes to find that one. And if not, I'm, I'm going to double check too. I may do another one just kind of to talk about um, anything else that maybe I, I missed in my first episode on funding about how to negotiate for better funding packages. Uh, so yeah, don't don't rush. But also, if you are, I guess, um, <laughs> lucky enough to have been admitted to multiple programs, uh, and you know for a fact that you're definitely not going to go to one of the, let's say, three, four, or five programs you've been admitted to, it's okay to say no to them or to get placed off of a wait list if you know you're not going to go there. And if you know that you don't really need this program as a form of leverage to get a better funding package elsewhere. So if you know for sure, I'm not going to go to Boston University, I'm not going to go to Ohio State, I'm not going to go to UC Irvine, whatever institution it is, it doesn't even really matter. I'm just mentioning random universities that pop up in my head. But if you know you're not going to go there, just go ahead and say no. That way you can open up a spot to someone else who is on a wait list, who is hoping to go there who does consider this school their top choice. So keep that in mind. Say no for the places you know for sure you're not going to go to where it doesn't make a difference to have their offer in any way. You can't use it for negotiating, etc. And then for all the others, get as much information as possible to help you make a decision. If you have to, make a spreadsheet and uh, not just about the funding, but also about the pros and cons of each institution, go ahead and do that. Um, Hopefully that will help you. If that doesn't quite help, then I also recommend talking to a trusted mentor or advisor and just talking it out with them because I I, I do that with my scholars each year. Not everyone, just whoever feels comfortable reaching out to me. And we'll, you know, talk for like an hour and they're just going on and on and on about the different schools and what they've learned. Sometimes I take notes, sometimes I don't because it's really obvious to me where they want to go and they just need to say it out loud. Like, they'll just keep going on and on and on about, I remember one year, (laughs) and if he listens to this podcast, he's going to know I'm talking about him. There was a student who had been dreaming of going to Stanford forever. I mean, that was his top choice. And then he ended up getting into U Chicago and Stanford and other programs, but those were the top choices. And he just kept talking about, you know, Stanford has this, Stanford has that, but U Chicago has this, and I had never considered that. And U Chicago this, and U Chicago, and just the excitement with which he talked about U Chicago, I just knew, I I knew that that's where he was going to go, that that was the place for him. He was surprised, pleasantly surprised, but this was all based on having gotten to know the students there, the professors there, the curriculum, the space, the location, all of these things. Uh, You know, the more he found out about it, the more he realized that was actually a better fit for him than the Stanford program. So keep that in mind. The more info you get, um, the more informed your decision will be and that way you make a choice that is right for you. Yeah, I think that's all I'm going to say for now. I know this is a shorter episode, (laughs) probably not as well thought out, but please bear with me. And yeah, if anything else comes up, I will follow up next week um, and add my extra thoughts then. Hope you all have a good weekend. All right, bye-bye. Thanks so much for joining me in the Grad School Fem Touring Podcast. If you liked what you heard, please rate this podcast on iTunes, Spotify, or anywhere you tune in. You can also support the podcast by donating to my Patreon page, Anchor page, or Venmo account, which is at Grad School Fem Touring. If you have questions or episode topics, you can contact me by sending me a DM on Instagram sending me an email to gradschoolfemtouring at gmail.com, sending me a voice message on Anchor, or sending me a message via my personal website at yvettemartinezvu.com. Until next time.